When we think about what a disease is, it helps to realize that not all of the tissues in the, and organs in the body have the same vulnerability. Some of them are quite robust and others are not. This is a function of tissue renewal and repair, sensitivity to stress, how vulnerable they are to threats, which are the weakest physiological links, to what degree evolution has built in safety factors, and much of this is governed by trade-offs and constraints. Actually, trade-offs are really central to much of this entire argument. And trade-offs are expressed in ways that change when the environment changes, so they interact with mismatches in the environment. Organs and tissues vary in robustness, resilience, and vulnerability, and it is this mosaic that determines the spectrum of diseases. And not all organs and tissues are as robust and resilient as possible, and the reason for that is quite interesting. It's because they would cost too much. In other words, if you try to make one thing really good, you neglect something else. Tissues with a high renewal rate and a repair capacity are relatively tolerant to damage. That would be most epithelia and the hematopoietic system, that is the system in the, blood in the bone marrow that produces blood cells. Here is an example of uh, bronchiolar epithelium. This has high renewal rate, high repair capacity, and it's relatively tolerant to damage. The same would be true of our, the skin epithelium. Tissues that have low renewal rate and repair capacity don't tolerate damage very well. Neurons and cardiomycetes are examples. Here's a cross-section of a rat spinal cord. It shows the neurons. Neurons don't really have nearly the regenerative capacity of other cells. They have more than had originally been thought, but when damaged, uh, it's often a catastrophe. Damage to something like an epithelial cell is pretty easily handled, and damage to something like neurons or to heart muscle cells can kill the organism. This is related to how sensitive, how sensitive organs and tissues are to stress. A tissue with high energetic demand relies just on oxidative metabolism, so that would be neurons and heart muscle. They are always in oxidative mode. Tissues that have low energetic demand can tolerate a lack of oxygen fairly well. They can switch from oxidative to glycolytic metabolism. So fat cells, adipocytes, fibroblasts, hematopoietic cells can all switch back and forth between these modes of metabolism. Now that's why ischemia, that is a lack of oxygen and nutrients, rapidly damages brains, hearts, and kidneys, often irreversibly and sometimes fatally. This argument makes especially interesting how the fetus manages to tolerate the anoxia that it experiences as it goes through the birth canal. So these are kinds of organs that do not tolerate stress very well. The brain, this is a human heart, and these are some kidneys. This is also related to vulnerability to threat. Things in our bodies that would be catastrophes to have damaged are especially protected. We have the cranium protecting the skull, the, protecting the brain, and we have our rib cage protecting the heart and lungs. So similar to that sort of morphological protection, we have tissues and organs that are immune privileged. They don't permit immune responses that have damaging side effects. Much of the damage of infection comes not from the infectious agent, but from the host reaction, and these tissues have downregulated that reaction. They include brain, eyes, and gonads. So they don't get inflamed very much, but they pay a price, because if an ac a pathogen can get access into such a tissue, then it can cause a lot of damage, meningitis in the brain, for example. Not all of the physiological links in the body are equally strong. If you, if you think of that as a chain that has a, a weak link, then it pays attention, it's, it's good to pay attention to what is that weakest link. If 
function is lost in various organs. Sometimes it doesn't make much difference, and at times, uh, in some organs, that means the organism would die right away. If there's a little bit of damage to liver, to skin, or to the intestinal epithelium, that will normally be tolerated and repaired. The same amount of damage to the pulmonary, cardiovascular, or central nervous systems causes severe disease and even death. These are the weakest links. Their malfunction kills, and they, their failure is often the cause of death in old people. It's the weakest links where special features have evolved to protect against catastrophic failure. So there is a diagram of the lung, of the cardiovascular system, and of the central nervous system. That is where we expect to see evolution to have generated protective mechanisms. These can be thought of as built-in safety factors. A safety factor in engineering is the ratio of functional capacity to expected maximal load. So bridges are built with very strong safety factors. To illustrate, if the body weight is W and the skeleton can bear a weight of 4W, then the safety factor of the skeleton is 4. That would mean that a person could stand upright and experience an acceleration of four times gravity in a rocket and the bones wouldn't break. Increasing the safety factor has cost. So in this case, further strengthening the skeleton would probably decrease mobility. That would be a trade-off. The greater the safety factor, the greater the resistance to damage, but the larger the costs of resistance. Here are a few safety factors. Human pancreas, safety factor of about 10. The wing bone of a flying goose, a safety factor of about six. Human kidneys, four. The leg bone of a running ostrich, about 2.5. The small intestine, about two. And interestingly, the backbone of a weightlifter, only one to 1.7. Now, in all of these issues, there are strong involvements of trade-offs and constraints. Many structures are vulnerable because they've been forced to compromise. In the synovial joint, the wrist, elbow, finger, shoulder, and knee, such joints have superior mobility. You can see that I can twist my wrist, I can rotate my fingers. That's all because these are synovial joints. However, they are all vulnerable to arthritis. Here is a diagram of the synovial joint. This would be between two finger bones. And they have within them this synovial cavity, which gives them extra buffering and extra flexibility. It's a fluid-filled cavity. Similarly, the alveolar sacs in the lung have excellent gas exchange, but they are vulnerable to pneumonia because they fill up with exudate if inflamed. So, there are trade-offs involved in the design of structures, and if you make them good for one thing, they may be vulnerable to another. Other structures are vulnerable because of historical constraints. The difference between the vertebrate eye and the octopus eye is quite famous. The vertebrate eye is different in a number of respects. For one, the blue tissue here is the nervous tissue, and the red is the retina. You can see two things. The nervous tissue and actually the blood vessels overlie the retina in the vertebrate eye, so light has to go through them to get to the light-sensitive cells. That's not true in the octopus eye. The retina is on the surface in the octopus eye with the nerves and blood vessels behind it. The other design problem in the vertebrate eye is that there's a blind spot where the nerves then go through the retina to get to the brain. And because they are behind the retina in the octopus, there's no blind spot in the octopus. That's a historical constraint. At the time that the vertebrate eye started to evolve, this was not a serious constraint. It was a simple light sensing organ. It wasn't being optimized for image quality and things like that. And it was, at that point, it made no difference that one tissue layer was above the other. That relationship, however, was maintained because of developmental induction. When those layers of cells are forming the eye, they have to be in that position in order to develop properly, and it's been that way now for about 550 million years. 
And the octopus eye, it started out probably for random reasons, the other way around, and that worked much better when evolution then perfected the octopus eye and made it into a really good image detector. Now, trade-offs interact with changes in the environment. After a reasonable amount of time, the cost-benefit balance of a trade-off has normally been optimized, and costs have been reduced as much as possible. If then that relationship is disturbed, the effect can be serious, especially if there are large benefits that are being balanced by large costs. You then get a pathology for two reasons. One is that the mechanisms controlling the balance are perturbed, and you could also have the environment changing. So that could be done with uh, a genetic mutation, or it could be done with a dramatic environmental change. So, two examples. The immune defense against infection is a big benefit. However, it has the high cost of immunopathology, that is autoimmune disease, and the risks of sepsis and anaphylactic shock, and the problem of inflammation. The clotting system in our blood is a great advantage. It keeps us from, from bleeding to death, but it carries the risk of embolism and stroke. So, these things are pervasive in the body, and things that have evolved as defense mechanisms usually have attendant costs. If the environment changes, the costs may exceed the benefits until evolution catches up. Of course, we've discussed some of that. We will go into it in further detail. Modern hygienic environments are abnormal. They elicit pathological immune responses, asthma, allergies, eczema, and autoimmune disease. Those are all things that result when the immune system reacts abnormally to the historically abnormal lack of commensal organisms. Changes in diet and inflammation can also increase the risk of clotting disorders. So to summarize this, the morphology and the physiology of the patient is a mosaic of tissues and organs and processes that vary in their vulnerability to damage, in their capacity for repair, in their sensitivity to stress, and in their built-in safety factors. The key idea running through these issues is that of trade-offs. Each of these features has benefits and costs. When perturbations shift the cost-benefit balance, they elicit pathologies. So situations in which the costs are then greater than the benefits.